Good evening and welcome to our service here at Glenburn Methodist Church. I'm Jim Ray and I've been asked by Cheryl to give the word at this evening service. And so we're delighted to have you wherever you are. We don't know how many will be there, but wherever you're viewing this service, we pray that you'll find in all of the service a blessing. Let's take a moment for prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you today for your great love for us. We thank you for the amazing way in which Jesus went to the cross, bore our sin on the cross, and rose again from the dead. We thank you that we have the great possibility of meeting with the living Christ, experience his forgiveness, and know his love. Help us, Lord, as we enter into this time of worship and praise to hear your word to us, whatever it may be. Help us to know that we are loved with an everlasting love. None of us are set aside, but all of us are loved by you. Help us in this evening service to grasp that experience of the wonder of your love once again as we offer our prayer in Jesus' name. We recall the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
Our New Testament reading this evening comes from John chapter 3, reading verses 16 to 21. And this is from the New Revised Standard Version. John 3, verses 16 to 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, the people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Amen.
So there it is. I'm watching football at Windsor Park and I see it up in the corner. Someone is holding it up and it simply says, John 3, 16. One day I happened to switch on to a Gaelic football match at Crook Park. It was one of the great finals in the world of Gaelic. And I saw it again. John 3, 16. Rather contrasting places, Windsor Park, the home of Linfield Football Club, and Crook Park, known for its nationalist background. John 3, 16. I quote the authorised version. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In these days following Easter, this text of scripture has come to me again and again. Somehow or other, it sums up the whole nature of the gospel. It was Martin Luther who on one occasion said that John 3 and 16 was in fact the gospel in a nutshell. Significantly over the years, as I have preached in many places, I've seldom preached on this text of scripture. It is so familiar, so well known, so obvious, that one might go to something a little more obscure at times than something that is so simple as this verse of scripture. Now as we look at it, in the season through Easter and into the season of Eastertide, I want to wrap it in four very simple words. John 3, 16. The first thing I see is the expanse of God's love. For God so loved the world. It doesn't say that God has loved a certain group of people. It doesn't say that God has a special unit in the world that he loves. It says that God loves the world, the cosmos, the whole creation. I have been thinking about that. I've been thinking about the seven billion coming to eight billion people in the world. Every sort, every ethnicity, every kind. And the Bible says, God loved the world, every individual. I think it was Philip Yancey who on one occasion said that God loves you as if there wasn't another person in the world. Quite profound and yet remarkable. I understand, having looked at this in Wikipedia, that 107 billion people have already died. So that means that all of those people, 115 billion people that are in this world or have gone from this world, are loved by God. The amazing expanse of God's love. One time a man called Frank Lehman in the early part of the 20th century wrote a hymn. He quoted the hymn in a church and then was told by a member of the congregation a little bit of the history of the hymn. In actual fact, a man had seen this scrawled on a wall of an asylum 200 years before. The hymn is simply this. Lehman, in fact, took these words and embraced them into the hymn that he had written. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole if stretched from sky to sky. The expanse of God's love. But this text of scripture tells us something else. It speaks to us of the extent of God's love. It simply says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. 
that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This generous giving of God meant that Jesus, the Son of God, as the Nicene Creed puts it and the authorised version, begotten, not made. This person in the Trinity of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit came and allowed himself to be put upon a cross at Calvary. The old hymn says, O oh, the love that drew salvation's plan, O oh, the grace that brought it down to man, O oh, the mighty act that God did span at Calvary. That is to say, that as we look at the cross, and there are many aspects of looking at it, here we see the immense, amazing love of God. Here we see the, the conquering of evil by Jesus on the cross, the triumphant Jesus in the resurrection. But we're here we see how Jesus died for you and me. I recall remembering many years ago, hearing one evening of the death of Billy Clements. Billy Clements is the son of David Clements. Billy was shot by the IRA at Ballygolly. Billy was a preacher, a local preacher, a man who went to convents to pray with nuns and was involved in prayer meetings throughout that part of Northern Ireland. But that night he was shot dead. There's a story behind it because the truth of the matter is that Billy had rearranged his duties as a policeman with another policeman in order that earlier in the week he could attend a prayer meeting. The other policeman should have been on the duty, but he escaped with his life. Interesting you might look at that for a moment and say, Billy Clements, it could be said there's another man there who died in his place. That happens. Someone dies in another person's place. Writing in his letter to the Romans, Paul speaks about that. He says that sometimes a person will die for a, a righteous cause. More often, someone will die for a, a good cause. But God shows his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the salvation story that goes through the whole of the Bible. The 1600, 619 laws of Judaism, all the things that you read in the Old Testament, all of the rituals that are necessary in order to make sure you have a relationship with God in some kind of way, are gone. Christ is our great high priest. Christ is the supreme sacrifice. It was C.S. Lewis who on one occasion, giving a lecture in a university in England, was asked a question. The question was, could you tell us the differences between all the world religions? Very difficult question to ask or even answer in a few minutes, but C.S. Lewis did. Well, he said there are basically two religions in the world. There's the religion that tells you what you must do for God. And there is the religion that tells you what God has done for you. That's the Christian faith. The extent of God's love on the cross. Jesus died for you. Which brings me to the third word. It is the word experience that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The implication is simply that those who trust in Christ, believe means trust. Those who turn away from all other ways and simply put their trust in Jesus, experience 
his power and his presence in their lives, which is described here as eternal life. Something that begins in a, a limited way in this life and continues forevermore in the life to come. We've all been saddened by the death of the Duke of Edinburgh. He is a remarkable, he was a remarkable man and much has been written about him. Now I must confess that I was in the presence of the Duke of Edinburgh on one occasion. I was in a church where he visited and he came down the aisle of the church and he waved over at me. That was my experience of the Duke of Edinburgh. Now, if you ask me to write an article for a paper or a church magazine on the Duke of Edinburgh, I think I could do it. I think there's enough material out there to allow me to write 500 words for a, a little article about the contribution of Prince Philip to the world in which we live. But do I know him? Certainly not. Do, know, do I know about him? I do. I've read the papers. I've watched the television. But I truly do not know him. Now, I think it's true that many of us could say, I could write some words about Jesus. I could write about his life, about his death, about his resurrection. I could write a story about Jesus. There's enough there to do that. But do I experience him? You see, experiencing someone is much more than that. It is a sense when the reality of what's in the Bible becomes a reality for you and me. When I was working in another church in the country, I would often go to a congregation nearby to preach. One of the leading laymen in the congregation would come to me after the service and speak warmly to me. He was a businessman in the local area and he was well known and well thought of. He never said much about faith, but I never presumed anything other than he probably was a Christian. Several years later, I went back to that church to preach at a harvest service. And there he was, sitting in the congregation. Well, interestingly, he was nodding. He was smiling. I never got that kind of body language message from my friend before. Going out the door, or going through the church on the way out, shaking his hand, I warmly shook his hand and I said, you're looking different. Are you, are you well? Great to see you. And then he looked at me and he said, Jim, since the last time you were here, I have experienced the love of God and have come to know Christ. He was a different man, almost like John Wesley on the 24th of May, 1738, when he said in that little building in London, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did know Christ. That's a, an experience of being a Christian. It's called the witness of the Spirit. Paul talks about it. He speaks about the Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. That's a possibility for every single one of us. Somehow, as Colin Morris in one of his books says, there is in the Christian experience the moment when the penny drops. Finally, let me just add one other word. It is the word aspiration. If you look at John 3 and 17, you will see these words. It says this, that Jesus Christ came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I find that a great verse. Because the following verses do speak about what it means if we reject Christ, if we 
totally and utterly reject the gospel, there is a sense of judgment and condemnation. But I want to put it on this side, that God is not out to condemn you. I know many people in churches who, for some reason or other, whatever has happened in their past lives, feel a sense of condemnation, a sense of unworthiness. He came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world, through him, might be saved. Several years ago, I went to hear the famous Pentecostal evangelist, Reinhard Bonke, preach in the O2 Arena. On that night, he said something in his sermon that set me up a bit. It brought my attention. He said, God wants heaven to be full and hell to be empty. Oh, I thought, that's interesting. But you know, it's not interesting. It is Peter in his epistle who says, he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I don't know how you're hearing this this evening, whether it's on the time or later on in the day, but the aspiration is simply this, that God wants you and me to experience the wonderful eternal life that lasts forevermore with Christ in heaven. Four words. Expanse, extent, experience, and aspiration. I remember how on one occasion, as a teenager, I went to Windsor Park in 1961. It was a summer evening, and according to the records, despite the amazing football games that have been at Windsor Park, never before in the history of that football stadium were more people in it than on that evening. 56,000, I believe. Who was preaching? Well, you don't have to guess. It was Billy Graham. And on that night in Windsor Park, Billy Graham took this text from John 3.16 and spoke about it. What happened afterwards was the wonderful wow moment when hundreds and hundreds of people streamed onto the pitch as they sung just as I am and give their life to Christ. As you hear me this evening, I pray this is not Windsor Park. This is probably a small group of people listening to this service, watching it in whatever way. But what happened to the many people that night in the summer of 61 can happen tonight at the conclusion of this service. Here's what A.W. Tozer says, great Christian writer. This is about each and every one of us. It says, he knows you individually as though there were no other person in the entire world. He died for you as certainly as if you had only been the only lost one. He knows the worst about you and he's the one who loves you most. Let's take a moment for prayer. Lord, in the quietness of this moment, each of us are listening and may your Holy Spirit prompt us to know that God loves us, to know that Christ died for us. And in this moment, as we're all sinners, may we give our lives to him and find the wonderful experience and assurance of eternal life. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord God, you are the Father of all people. And we come before you today with our prayers, knowing that you will hear us, Lord. You will help us, Lord, and you will guide us. First, we pray for reconciliation and forgiveness in our own lives. Peace will begin with us. And we ask, Lord, that the change that we also long for in the world would be present in our own lives and be an example to others. We ask you, Lord, to help us seek out opportunity to work for understanding and tolerance between people of different religious backgrounds, different social backgrounds, different racial backgrounds, Lord, and political backgrounds. We pray especially that religious views would not lead to bitterness and hatred between us, your children, whom you love so much and with whom your patience and tolerance is boundless. We remember the example, Lord of the Good Samaritan, who reached out to someone outside of his own religion and culture. May this example, Lord, inspire us to go beyond our own comfort zones and help those in need, regardless of them being different to ourselves. Lord, we pray for people who are frightened because they are ill. Father, reassure them that because of the knowledge that you give to us, many diseases can now be cured, especially at the moment, Lord, in the midst of a pandemic. We pray for reassurance, for confidence and for hope. We pray for those administering the vaccines, Lord, that you will give them strength and courage and enable them to do the best of their ability with you walking along beside them. You turn our darkness, Lord, into light. And in your light, we shall see light. Father, we pray for those whose hearts have been saddened by the death of someone close to them or dear to them and someone who is ill in their family or friendship group. Lord, help us to help them experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit and know that the fellowship of the church is surrounding them, that they are loved, that they are cared for, and that you are with them no matter what. Let's take a second and just remember before God um, those loved ones that we have lost or people who are ill at this time. Lord, be with us in the week ahead as we go out into the world. Lord, may the lips that have sung your praises always speak your truth. May ears which have heard your word always listen only to what is good. And may our lives, as well as our worship, always be pleasing in the sight of God for your glory. Amen.
Lord, your birth we celebrate, your death we remember, your resurrection we proclaim, and your coming again in glory we await. Amen. <laughs> 